This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014, an interview with Greg Barnes, the general counsel at the Digital Media Association. DMT's coverage of South by Southwest is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com and by Music Graph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or Developer.MusicGraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to DMT's coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure today to have uh, Greg uh, Barnes uh, from uh, uh, General Counsel at uh, DEMA. So hi Greg and thanks for joining me, how's it going? It's going pretty good, I'm enjoying my time down here in South by Southwest, uh, a lot of things to see, a lot of people to bump into, a lot of good conversations about the music industry. Yeah, and so uh, I mentioned to you in the prep that unfortunately I had, a, I had an interview with uh, Lee Knife from your organization last year that uh, had a massive technical glitch, so it didn't quite come off the ground, so I really look forward to, to talking to you today. And so first off, uh, what is Dima and what, what you do? Well, Dima represents uh, a lot of... Um, I would say, to be, to be a little humble, we represent the leading online distributors of digital content. Uh, so if you're a connoisseur of ebooks, uh, more than likely you interact with uh, one of our member companies. If you purchase music downloads or you like to stream music, you probably interact with one of our companies. Same thing holds true with respect to video. Nowadays, people are renting movies online, digital copies of movies online. A lot of people are subscribing to monthly uh, streaming services, uh, and, and we represent those guys as well. What we do are a couple things uh, as a trade association. We advocate before Congress for changes in the legislative landscape that make for a more conducive um, and innovative experience one for consumers but also to be honest for distributors for the companies that we represent uh, we also kind of um, weigh in before federal agencies and we make appearances before federal courts all on behalf of our industry Sure. And so there, there's a bunch of issues that are, uh, you know, uh, up for uh, debate at the moment in in the U.S., especially when it comes to copyright and all of that. So first up, let's touch upon, uh, you know, the copyright review that was uh, sort of outlined uh, uh, last year by Maria Palante around, uh, uh, you know, just just after this time. It was uh, not not a year ago yet, but uh, uh, coming up to it. So what's yeah. happening on that front? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, let, let's start at the, at the, you know, at the beginning. You're right. About a year ago, Maria Plente, as part of her um, annual speech before, I believe, it was Columbia University, she talked about, you know, the next great copyright act. I think that was the title of the speech. And and, and through that speech, she went through a a whole list of. Um, reforms or updates that should be made to the copyright law that would actually bring it into this you know this modern current environment that we're in and and we at DEMA can't be more supportive of the notion of updating the law because we do feel like it, 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 many of these laws were written the last time the, the the body itself was written was in 1976 since then there have been some minor tweaks and revisions but over the, for the most part there hasn't been a major overhaul so we really look forward to that opportunity uh, since then not much has happened though what what we've seen and, and there are a few positive things but the few things we've seen is um, Congress has had a series of hearings on various uh, type rock related issues today as a matter of fact they're talking about the DMCA digital millennium copyright um, section 512 of that which deals with the notice and takedown process yeah. um, needs some uh, some reviewing that <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I think it depends on who you ask how much work needs to be done there. Um, copyright owners have expressed some concern about um, the repeated notices that need to be sent um, for um, identical infringing yeah. works. Um, and service providers have voiced some concern about um, over-inclusive notices and or um, inaccurate notices. Yeah. And so that's placed a certain burden on them as well. So I guess, yeah, there has been at least some concerns, of, but how you go forward and how you reform that process, yeah. I think there hasn't been any type of uh, consensus around that. Yeah, sure. One of the big uh, things that's happening right now in the court, in the New York courts, really, is, is the rates battles and uh, talking about, you know, uh, negotiations around compulsory licenses, uh, what the rates should be. You know, there's some publishers that want to pull out their digital rights from uh, uh, ASCAP and BMI and do direct deals with providers like Pandora. It's, it's a bit of a mess. You know, I, 
uh, I've covered this field quite quite a bit, so people that have followed the show, they, they have an idea of what's going on, because uh, I've, I've tried to explain it as much as possible, but in your view, you know, what are the key, the core issues there, and uh, is there a potential resolution that is outside of court, or are we going to have to see a resolution through court on that? It's a good question. Uh, the key is money. <laughs> That's it's, it's a, <laughs> let's just simplify it. It's all about money. Uh, right now, we, as you know, when we're when we're trying to figure out rates for the public performance of musical compositions, we turn to one of the three leading PROs, uh, one of the three PROs in this country, ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. And uh, based upon, at least with respect to ASCAP and BMI, based upon the consent decree that operates here in the U.S., you know, it it we're granted a blanket license, and we are guaranteed to be able to license uh, content based upon a reasonable royalty. Yeah. What What is happening now is you do see individual publishers withdrawing from that process because they actually want to increase the rate in which they receive from um, online distributors. Yeah. Our concern, I mean, is, is pretty straightforward. I mean, we feel like if the, the current process provides a reasonable royalty, our question is kind of like, well, what are you looking for? I mean, are you looking for something unreasonable? Um, because by definition, you're already getting something reasonable. And so, yeah, you're right. It is a mess. Um, that's why you see Pandora, which is not within the demon membership, but you know we have um, very similarly closely aligned interest going to court trying to actually fight for a reasonable royalty. And, and you see publishers saying we don't we want to withdraw from the process altogether. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And uh, looking at uh, some of the other issues that are happening, I mean, one of the key things that I was excited about last year uh, was the Global Repertoire Database announcement and, and what was happening around that and the fact that we're finally going to get an index of uh, uh, a body of works in the music industry that was uh, recognized internationally and was going to work out, uh, you know, at least uh, who owned what and, you know, make it a bit more straightforward. So, but uh, the project uh, since then, at least from the latest I hear, is, is hitting some stumbling blocks. So uh, are you disappointed about that? And, and why you, what's your take on it? Yeah, we are disappointed. We at DEMA, as a matter of fact, I spoke um, Tuesday of this week. These days are starting to run together. Tuesday, I spoke on a panel um, in Washington, D.C. about orphan works. And one of the things that we stress, again, as royalty paying online distributors of content, it's really important for us to be able to identify and locate the owners of copyrights. I mean, if 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 we're a company out there, or we represent multiple companies, and we're interested in using this work and paying the copyright owner, the whole system breaks down if we can't find that person. Um, I think the copyright owner loses out on money that or yeah. revenues that they could have collected. Distributors, you know, as a business, our businesses aren't as attractive because yeah. we don't have as many copyrights to actually distribute. And um, from the consumer perspective, and let's let's I can't emphasize the consumer perspective enough. I mean, this whole system is about making sure that these works are then distributed and so that people can enjoy them. And they lose out because then they can't enjoy them legally and, and my companies are not going to distribute content illegally. Yeah. You asked specifically about the, the database. I don't do as much with that directly, but it is my understanding. I don't want to point fingers, but I was talking to uh, uh, a relatively large um, company that operates in this space everybody knows uh, them very well and I and I've, I understand that you know some of the organizations that had agreed to actually pay for the uh, construction of the database decided that they were not willing to pay and so I think that's slowed down the process a bit and I don't want to name names yeah, sure of course yeah, yeah. It's, uh, no, it's a shame because you know this is a sorely needed uh, thing and if if they it could solve a lot of problems and uh, you know it's it's certainly not something that is going to be government funded so somebody's going to have to fund it at some point <laughs> no no gov yeah government's not going to fund it yeah because it's uh <laughs> it's private property essentially you know right. copyright material so that's uh, that's going to be an interesting fight and so there were a couple of uh, interesting issues that you you talked about on on the dima site uh, in the last uh, couple of months so mm -hmm. now first of all the songwriter equity act uh, yeah. so what's that all about for people that haven't uh, haven't heard about this uh, well, the, the bill does a couple of things. Um, it, the, the first thing, it changes the rate setting standard uh, that we currently use for the mechanical license. So um, I don't know if I need to unpack that for your audience a little bit, maybe, maybe just a little bit. Okay, great. So let, let's just take an online music store. So an online music store, and they, before I even get there, let me back up. So every song has two copyrights attached to it. One is the sound recording, the other is the musical composition. So whenever one of my member companies is trying to make use of a song, they have to pay two copyright owners. 
for the most part. Sometimes they were two hats, but in general, you have to make two payments. When you're thinking about uh, trying to buy a purchase a music download, uh, so same thing holds true. That online music store has to pay for the reproduction or distribution of the musical composition, and they also have to pay the owner for the reproduction and distribution of the sound recording. Yeah. Um, here in the U.S., there's this provision in the Copyright Act, Section 115, that determines uh, the rate. There's a rate setting standard that we use that determines how much we have to pay for the reproduction and distribution of the composition. We actually go and sit down directly with the labels to actually figure out how much we have to pay for the reproduction and distribution of the sound recording. Under existing law, the rate setting standard is what we here have kind of dubbed the 801B standard yeah. because it's a four-factor test outlined in Section 801B of Title 17. That bill, uh, the Songwriter Equity Act you mentioned, it would change that standard from the 801B standard to a willing buyer, willing seller standard. And we've expressed some concerns as distributors about that. On its face, it sounds good, willing buyer, willing seller. The problems are you know, two or three fold. Main problem is you're, you're only talking about one willing seller, you know, but multiple willing buyers. Automatically, if you think about that in economic terms, you then end up with a higher rate because there's not people competing on the higher end in terms of pricing. There are only people competing on the lower end. Bigger companies, obviously, in terms of a willing buyer will pay more, but then there are a lot of small companies who are willing buyers that will pay a lot less. But the, the, the top line then gravitates towards the willing seller rate. So we're concerned for that reason. And we also have empirical evidence. When you look at that standard, the willing buyer, willing seller standard, it's codified an existing law under section 114 of the Copyright Act. Right. So that's, so now I'm getting into non-interactive internet radio. So when you're a webcaster and you're trying to figure out how much you have to pay, you go through a 114 CRB process and it's under the willing buyer, willing seller standard. Yeah. I can't say this emphatically enough. It has been a disaster for the internet radio business. I mean, what you see now is if you just go back five to ten years ago, you see multiple large companies operating in this space, the 114 space, trying to figure out how to build new businesses, how to reward copyright owners. Many of them have left the business and Pandora is by far the largest who still operates under the 114 license. There are still some smaller companies that do that, but most of them operate outside of 114 and they do on-demand streaming, which isn't eligible for the 114 license. Right. Yeah. So this essentially, I mean, it, it, it's a big debate, right, isn't it? Uh, whether uh, you know, it's the rates are, are causing the economic problems of the, of the companies, or whether uh, you know, I, I hear from also a lot of labels that say, well, actually, they should find a way to make more money and be able to pay more. So it's just it's just a really tricky debate, isn't it, on, on that front? Oh gosh, you, <laughs> we're going to probably have to edit this part out. Um, <laughs> I'm. I'm always intrigued when I hear the record labels suggest um, ways for my companies to um, better monetize yeah. <laughs> their business models. Okay, so I think I've said it in a more elegant way, so good, So, because I could have gone a very snarky route. But our companies spend on a daily basis an incredible amount of time of trying to figure out how you can bring to market attractive products that consumers are willing to pay for. The notion that we are intentionally leaving money on the table, like, oh no, there's a lot more money that can be made out there, and, and no, my companies don't want to make the money, I mean, it's, it's somewhat absurd. The, the fact of the matter is, copyright owners don't appreciate it, is the internet has leveled the playing field the internet demands efficiency, pricing efficiency. And what you have is you have a lot of owners who still have kind of these flashbacks to the analog world where there probably was a lot more anti-competitive, monopolistic pricing taking place. That's been eliminated by and large um, because of the internet. Uh, and the other thing that's changed that they don't fully appreciate is there's so many distractions that exist now that didn't exist years ago. Used to be music consumed most people's leisure time. Yeah. Now you have social gaming. Now you have things like Facebook. You have things like Twitter. You have things, as a person who now is leaving the young generation, turning <laughs> go a little bit older, you have all these 
apps you know that that take people's time away from music take people's time away from video and so they're not willing to pay as much for some of those other things as they were back when it consumed the vast majority of their leisure time so it's those things that i think copyright owners aren't willing to understand and or accept yeah, it's sure. a nice way of answering your question. I think, I'm glad. I'm glad I, I did it in a better I, way. You, you swung it really well, so that's great. If you had to pick uh, one uh, hot topic for 2014 uh, for Dima uh, when it comes to the music space, uh, what would it be? Uh, I, I would say Section 115 reform, reforming the mechanical license. Right. Yeah. I I think that it's still a process by which it's very tedious for us to license the right for musical compositions. I think. We've also talked about um, expanding it maybe to cover interactive streaming. Right. Um, so again, as I mentioned uh, a second ago, you do have interactive radio, the Spotify's, the Rhapsodies of the world, Slacker has uh, interactive service. Right now, they're not eligible for a compulsory license because they don't meet the Section 114 non-interactive definition. Yeah. And, you know, Section 115, if you follow the black letter writing of that, that section, it only talks about digital um, DPDs so so what we're thinking is it would be good if we updated section 115 um, or added a new section I don't, I'm not saying it has to go necessarily in that section of, of the Copyright Act but if there was some way to make sure that interactive streaming was covered under compulsory license that's actually interesting because I, I was talking about that yesterday in, in respect to the fact that beats uh, music came out with uh, uh, you know saying that they're gonna pay the same rates to all rights holders which is an interesting development and also something that hasn't been seen before because we all know that Spotify has different deals with labels uh, with majors that it has with independence and, and with a with a smaller artist and so so in that sense would that completely change the game of, uh, of, of payments as well well, I don't, I don't know enough about the Beats process, but let me, let me say this, um, speaking a, a little bit about artist compensation and money flows. It, it is sure. one of the subjects that we, we try to educate members of Congress on because, again, a lot of these arguments go back to money compensation. When a service like Spotify, which I think people have really read about that and there's been a lot of uh, published reports about how they compensate artists. A couple things are important to know. One, to launch that service, the interactive service, because they had to do direct deals outside of the compulsory license, they actually gave up an equity in the service itself. What that percentage is, I don't know. Some reports have said as much as 20%. Could be less, could be more. Don't know for sure. That 20%, I'm told, doesn't go to artists. It actually is held within the record labels and they do whatever they, they wish or decide to do. Uh, maybe for a new projects, so maybe it does go to up and coming artists, but yeah. it, it, it does, it's not tied to streaming, put it that way. And then on the back end, what happens is, obviously uh, Spotify does pay a certain rate per stream to the labels. Um, how that money is divvied up is really de determined by the record label and the contract that they have. Um, so even when you hear a beat say, oh, we're going to pay artists the same thing. If they use an intermediary, you don't really know for sure if artists are actually receiving compensation. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. On equal, well, I just want to, because people read that and they think, oh, yeah, well, Beast is just giving, you know, if you're Lady Gaga or if you're Rihanna, <laughs> you all get the same amount. That's not necessarily the case because no, it's tied to the record. contract label. that you exactly. signed, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's uh, that's really interesting. And, and, and I'm sorry, before, yeah, I just sure, don't want to cut you off, but the, the, the one thing I'll say is it's, it's another reason why we argue for the compulsory license. The one thing we've heard from um, musicians, large and small, is the 114 license awards a lot more transparency than you get in the direct licensing process. Under the section 114, you know if you're a company like Pandora, you pay a certain rate per performance, that money goes to Sound Exchange. 50% of the money in Sound Exchange has to go um, to the record label, and then the other 50% is shared between recording artists, backup uh, feature vocalists, and musicians. Yeah. Uh, and so th that's interesting actually because uh, uh, we're only going to see really what happens uh, uh, with the equity stakes uh, for the first time uh, once and if Spotify goes uh, public this year. And I think uh, at that point we're going to see a lot of backlash from, from artists that 
realize the valuation of the company and realize the equity stake that the labels have uh, because I guess some of those filings are going to have to be made public uh, uh, as far as uh, equity stakes are concerned and so if artists see that uh, you know uh, a Universal or a, or a Sony have made you know a billion dollars over the uh, Spotify going public they're going to start thinking oh well why am I not getting any money out of this the valuation is really based on on the value of my catalog and that's why you managed to get an equity stake in, in the company in the first place so so I think there's going to be some interesting times ahead I think you're absolutely right, and I think my argument for a at least exploring the possibility of a compulsory license in the context of interactive streaming is uh, it's going to be boosted tremendously. I think then you actually have an artist saying, maybe we should look at this because then again, we get more transparency from the process that we don't get right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, where can people find out more about Dima and uh, re read up some of the material? Yeah, so our website is www.digmedia. Uh, digital is abbreviated, so it's digmedia.org. Um, we we try and update the website as often as possible, but you know we're even though we're a technology trade association, sometimes we get you know bogged down with other things. But sure. you can you can read about our press releases, our statements, read about what our companies are doing. Um, we try to even offer some kind of light, more entertainment stuff where we list the hottest like downloads we list the hottest viral videos cool. i mean we really try to serve as the ambassador for the digital media industry be it digital music be it uh, movies or books that's great well thank you so much for your time it was a pleasure thank you it was a pleasure i enjoyed it thanks and thanks for listening to the dnt coverage of south by southwest you can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digital music trends